Well, thank you for joining me today. That's yeah, well, great. thank you. I mean, we've we talked about. Let me get let me get recording. Okay, here we go. So we talked we talked about this, and and one of the things I wanted to do was was sort of interview you and and pull your story out of you. Now, ever you I mean you were one of the people that very early on when I started this channel, um, you know, you contacted me, and of course, I have I have zero or I had zero, I'd never, I'd ne I didn't know anything about Carl Jung. Um, and of course, so, so I, so part of, you know, in, in anticipation of probably other conversations where you get a little bit more detailed into Jung, I wanted to, as I've done with so many other people on my channel, I want to, I want to help give a context to you and your thoughts. And I think especially given some of the conversations we've had already, that, that context in terms of your story is, is very helpful for figuring out what you have to say about Jung and how this has shaped your life. Because you, you have a pretty significant YouTube channel devoted to Carl Jung's work and exploring right. his work. So I thought it would be very helpful to basically hear some of your story. And you and I have talked about this just on our own, but I thought it'd be fun and good to have it up on the channel. Uh, okay, well, um, in 1987, um, I was working in the graduate school of the University of Maryland teaching finance, believe it or not. Well, let's, let's bring things back even further than that, okay? Uh -huh. The home that you were raised in, were your parents religious? Um, somewhat. Um, my, um, my father was a career naval officer, and so we lived all over the United States and later the world. And um, we did go to uh, chapel, which is an interdenominational chapel, Protestant chapel in those days. And, and so uh, you could think of it, uh, in those days, you could think of it as sort of a Calvinist type of environment or a Presbyterian type of environment. And, um, and so when we came back from an assignment in Kodiak uh, in about 1954. Um, we, my parents tried several churches in Quapaw, Michigan and ended up uh, selecting the Presbyterian church. There's, there's a long story there, but I'm not going to go into it. And um, my father had been raised as a Baptist, um, you know, not a Southern Baptist, but a, just a Northern Baptist. Uh, and uh, my mother had been raised as a Lutheran, I think. And she came out of a family. My, my great-grandfather was Pennsylvania Dutch, oh. and, um, and my family was a Dutch, as I've talked about, but also... Um, um, Swedish, uh, German, or Pennsylvania Dutch, and well, Pennsylvania uh, Dutch isn't Dutch. It's really <laughs> it's <and> German. German. <laughs> yeah, right. But, but, now, but so we were real. To, we were real Dutchmen too. That's right. So you went to. So you left the house at some point. You did you go into straight into the military for a military career? Uh, after I finished uh, college, I did. Okay. What was your what were your religious spiritual ideas going into college? Did you go to a secular university or to a religious school? I went to Hamilton College, which was Presbyterian in orientation. Uh, I went at a time that there were many mandatories in that school, and so we were required to prove that we had gone to church every Sunday. We it could it could have been synagogue. I. I have a classmate who's a very prominent uh, rabbi, but um, but the church, the chapel on College Hill in Clinton, New York, is definitely a Presbyterian chapel, and uh, it was mandatory to attend one church. I didn't used to, for some reason, I didn't take to the to the college chapel and ended up going downtown to the. Presbyterian Church. Uh, which, and what was your experience of that? Was that something you were raised with and just doing? It's important for a lot of people younger than both of us to know that the posture 
towards religion in the United States in the middle of the Cold War was quite different than it is today. Yes. There was, I mean, it was very common for schools that had religious histories, of which many, many colleges have, to have mandatory chapel and to have expectation that students will attend religious services on weekends. This is all part of being a good citizen, being a good American, being an upstanding person. That's very much the the style of religiosity during the Cold War. That's, that's right. A- but uh, I, w- I would say that my experience was very much like C.G. Young's experience, as he explained in the one video where he said, uh, of course, everybody went to church and you know, and did you believe in God? Yeah, everybody believed in God. And um, so growing up, that's more or less the way it was. Um, However, my experience with uh, confirmation was the same as his, which is um, nothing happened on that day. And, um, you know, I still went to church, uh, but, um, but I never had a a religious experience per se at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, then uh, I haven't done much with church for uh, 40 years. I was, um, after I finished law school and started practicing law, um, I was uh, a deacon in the uh, Reformed Church, the, you know, Christian Reformed Church, in Greece, New York, uh, about probably from church in America. Um, I, 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 uh, <laughs> don't worry about the details. Some, I don't know. Some people listening to me will know the details, but nobody else will care. Right. And, and, you know, somebody said, well, it's like Presbyterian. And, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I thought it was a distinction without a difference. So I, uh, went to that church and, um, you know, worked my way into the point where I became a deacon, mm-hmm. and um, and then uh, we went off. My wife and I went off to Japan uh, after five years, and uh, in Japan we were members of the Tokyo Union Church, which is a, a church that was founded about uh, 1860. It's right in the in the right down among them in, in Tokyo on Mote Sando, which is uh, uh, the main drag. If you've ever seen pictures of people doing 50s style dancing in the streets in Tokyo with big hoop skirts and all that stuff, uh, that was done right in front of our church <laughs> in those days. And so we were we were active members of that church. And meanwhile, my daughters um, attended um, kindergarten at uh, at Sacred Heart. Um, The the Sisters of the Sacred Heart had an English-speaking school in uh, Tokyo, and so they attended there. And so all my daughters went to kindergarten there, and one of them went through fifth grade there. So, so you were you were attending church. You and your wife attended church. Things began to change at some point, right? And then, and then, my family has always been affiliated with the Presbyterian Church uh, of Casnobia, New York. It's the first Presbyterian church, and that's a church that dates back to 1800. And one of my ancestors. Uh, stood on his head on the weather vane of the steeple of that church when he was building it, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> That's an apocryphal story, but anyway. <laughs> but, and, and officially to this day, I'm a member of that church, although my mother-in-law is now a member of the First Presbyterian Church at Annapolis. And uh, when I and motivated to go to services or go to a church for some reason, I usually go to the Naval Academy Chapel. Okay. But you've had some experiences along the way that have made you, um, uh, I don't know how I should say it, that have brought you to some some other places in your life. Yeah. Um, I, well, I started reading young and, and, Mind you that as I've learned more, um, I've learned that 
religious experiences often come at a time of trauma. And um, it so happened that I should cover a couple of quick things. One was that in 1990, I bought Man and His Symbols. And I read it over a period of one year, about three or four pages a night to my wife before we went to sleep. And at the end of that year, I felt like I had had a year of psychotherapy. Hmm. Then uh, in 1993 or so, uh, a Jungian analyst named Clarissa Pinkola Estes wrote a best-selling book called Women Who Run With the Wolves. And my mother gave it to my wife for Christmas. I picked it up and wouldn't give it to my wife for two days while I read it cover to cover. <laughs> and... Um, then at about that time, um, the American forces were coming back from Kuwait from, uh, with uh, uh, Norman Schwarzkopf. Um, I'm, um, I'm a 23-year service man in the Marines. I served as lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps Reserve mostly, but I did serve active duty in Vietnam. And... Um, my church experience there was uh, the chaplain would get up at his morning briefing with the colonel, and uh, typically on a Monday, he would say, well, we had 11 Marines in chapel yesterday, something like that. So the story that in there are no atheists in a foxhole just isn't true. There were, you know, people weren't going to church at that time, and I never went to church while I was in Vietnam. Uh, I did darken the door of the chapel one time. <laughs> I don't exactly remember why, but I had some business going with the chaplain. And uh, he had a nice chapel, which was a bunker with, with plastic fake stained glass windows in it. <laughs> and and uh, so, anyway, um, Schwarzkopf comes back from from Iraq, and I was rather angry with uh, President Bush at that time for running this war parade down the streets of, of Washington. I did not feel that it was appropriate for us to be aggrandizing the military that way, even though I'm a, a loyal Marine and always will be. Um, but I didn't think that was an appropriate thing for our country. And so I was angry about it. And I went for a long walk in Washington around the US Capitol. And I was trying to decide what I was going to be in the future. And I decided I wanted to be a writer. And so I decided to write a novel. And as I started to write that novel, um, within two days, I'm informed by Clarissa Pincola's Estes' book, um, I was taken over by, I was possessed by a visioning experience, an archetypal visioning experience, uh, which lasted eight months. And during that period, I wrote the novel. And I, at the time, I just thought I was writing a novel. And I said, wow, this must be what happened to you know, Tolstoy and all those guys. <laughs> and um, so I thought, it, you know, it was just a, a good experience, and um, the novel had certain shadow elements into in it, which I'm not going to go into here for these purposes. But um, I was sort of shocked at the content, and there was no stopping it. I mean, once once an archetype gets a hold of you, it's going to play through just like a record on the jukebox, and and so every morning. Uh, at 6 a.m., I was awakened by this vision, and I had to go to my computer and write 500 to 1,000 words, and then that was enough for that day, and I could go on with my regular life, but this went on for eight months. And at the end, when I had finished telling the story, and it's the story of the first woman prime minister of Japan, as a matter of fact, um, then it stopped. Okay, then the visioning experience stopped because I had played through uh, the archetype. Hmm. And um, so then um, 
I put that novel in my drawer for uh, 21 years for a variety of reasons. Uh, but in 1998, my daughter, one of my daughters had gone to Russia on a USIS fellowship. And uh, she came back having gotten mixed up with Christian missionaries. I don't know what flavor in Kazan, Tatarstan. And um, we got together for her 22nd birthday, just she and I. And um, we had a beautiful evening together for three hours. And as I was parting her from her, um, she said, well, Dad, I'm sorry to say this to you, uh, but I think you're going to hell, quote, unquote. <laughs> and I was, I was really knocked by that. Huh. Okay, I mean, I was, uh, that was a traumatic experience, especially after we'd had a beautiful evening together and, mm. and so on. And um, so I got in the car driving back from Washington to Annapolis and coming across, uh, suddenly I had a vision of Mephistopheles. Well, first of all, I was asking myself, who teaches a child to say such a thing to a parent? Number one. Okay, so that, so I was pretty angry. And then um, about halfway across, I had this vision of Mephistopheles plopping down in the seat next to me. And I didn't know what to do, so I cut the Faustian bargain. And because it was the Mephistopheles that I had envisioned from Faustus, unfortunately, I knew something about Jungian psychology. Uh, I cut the Faustian bargain. The bargain was that he could have my immortal soul on my death on condition that none of my daughters would think that of me for the rest of my life. Hmm. And he disappeared and he never came back. But that immediately gave me the idea. I mean, I was really angry at this, whoever this denomination was. We, since I don't know, I can't, I can't. Talk can't about denounce it. them. <laughs> I can't denounce them. Uh, but I was really angry about that. But I also realized that, wow, if that could happen to me, um, then it must be the case that pastors throughout history uh, have scared people into being loyal Christians by um, conjuring up images of the devil and causing them to have these kind of visions. And then people go, oh my God, I better go to church. And I'm sure that that must have happened. And, and because of my own experience with that, I know it happened. And, um, and so, uh, so I, I don't know if I've answered your question. No, you're doing great. Keep going. Okay. So, um, then over years, um, I had a number of uh, other experiences. I would call them religious experiences. <clears throat> and um, I think I've shown you this, but I'll show you uh, this image, um, which I put on my desktop, but now can't find naturally. Just a moment. Okay, so the, to set up the situation, um, I was in a, a fairly intense uh, lawsuit uh, after 2008, and um, I was having trouble with it. And uh, one day I was feeling particularly down in the dumps, and um, it was actually foreclosure of my house. It's no secret. And uh, I was quite angry about what had happened. Um, and so I was trying to fight it in the courts and not getting anywhere. And so I kept getting slapped back. And I actually went to the Court of Appeals of Maryland five times in the U.S. Supreme Court once. <laughs> wow. And, and That's I did, one heck of a foreclosure lawsuit. <laughs> right. Well, I, I estimated that I put about a million and a half dollars worth of uh, time, legal time, into that 
that effort. But in any case, um, I had been, I had just experienced one of my many losses in that case. Mm. And, um, and so I decided to go over to the Naval Academy Chapel and just clear my head. And um, I have a particular uh, pew that I like there. And if you go in there in the morning on a weekday, uh, none of the lights are on, but there's light from the stained glass windows. And um, I was really, I mean, seriously down in the dumps. And um, I sat down in this pew, which was, is in one of the cross arms. It's in the right cross arm. The chapel is the cathedral of the Navy, so it's set up like a cathedral. And, um, and so I was sitting in one of the pews that goes longitudinally in the building, not not facing the um, the uh, pulpit, but um, I ha I would have to look to my right to see it, see the pulpit. But directly in front of me was um, a very uh, prized uh, stained glass window that was done by Tiffany, and uh, I like that stained glass window very much. Um, and it has an image of Christ and in it, and I'm going to show it to you in a moment. But in any case, I'm in the darkened ch chapel, and um, suddenly a light came and just illuminated me with, a, with biblical reference. And, um, and I looked up at it, and my attitude just changed instantly. And I looked up, and I saw this scene, and I thought to myself, nobody is ever going to believe this unless I take a picture of it. And so I did take a picture of it, and I will show it to you now. So this is the picture. Oh, wow. And you can see the Tiffany stained glass window. The, the upper three uh, windows are the Tiffany. You can see below there, there are three smaller stained glass windows, but you can see the difference in quality uh, between the two. And then you can see the power of the light that was coming in on me, and it was only lighting up me. And this is a chapel that seats 2,000 people. And um, is that light coming through a window or is the light just there? It uh, came through a window. It was coming through a window with sunlight. And um, that, that Tiffany window is uh, above the balcony. So you can see the, I think you can see, yeah, the three, the three little windows are below the balcony. And okay. the Tiffany is above the balcony. And then there's a, an opening in the dome of the chapel what, through which this light was coming. And it completely changed my attitude. And I saw this scene and I said, my God, nobody is going to believe this or even appreciate what it is unless I take a picture. So I grabbed my cell phone and I snapped this picture. And this was on September 6, 2016, I believe was the date. And then I turned the, the camera back on myself and took this selfie. All right, so here's the selfie. And so you can see that my demeanor is entirely changed. I'm no longer down in the dumps. You can see how dark it is in the chapel, except for where I was sitting. And the image over my right shoulder there, which some people have asked, is that a gargoyle or something? Yeah, that's actually the, the, great symbol, the great seal of the U.S. Naval Academy <laughs> over my shoulder. Um, but, but that's an example of a religious experience that, that I had. And, uh, you know, I would define as Dr. Jung would define a religious experience as a numinous experience. It was highly numinous to me. And I'm, I would not suggest that it would be numinous to you necessarily, um, because these things are very personal. Um, but nonetheless, uh, for my lights, that was a, 
a very luminous uh, religious experience. Let me just cut off this light from my window here. Okay, so, um, and I'm sure you can appreciate that that's, that's a scene like we've seen in a few movies, for example, of, you know, religious style movies of, you know, whoever, uh, you know, light comes on them and shines on them and then they're moved to become a saint or something like that. Not that I'm any saint, but, um, but you know, it definitely moved me and it definitely completely changed my attitude at, for the day. And um, there was another experience um, at the Naval Academy Chapel in exactly the same place. Um, one of the reasons in my mind why I was fighting my lawsuit uh, was that um, I took an oath to defend the country against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I had figured out that the financial industry had managed to get themselves paid double on most defaulted mortgages, once by the TARP and once by um, citizens who didn't understand that they didn't actually owe the money because the money had been paid off long ago. Right. And and so this is this is a continuing ongoing problem we have in our um, economy where the financial industry has gotten away with um, doing that and basically they harvested the life savings of the baby boom in my opinion um, and uh, they got away with it and it's going to happen again I'm afraid because I wasn't able to do what I hoped I could do with my lawsuit. So anyway, I was in the chapel again on another occasion. Again, I was down in the dumps after one of my losses with the Court of Appeals, I think. And uh, I was sitting in the same seat and I was leaned leaning forward in an attitude of prayer. And as I said, I felt that I had, um, that I was fighting this suit based in part based on my oath as a Marine officer. And as I was leaning forward and in this attitude of prayer, I envisioned the five men I know who have given their lives for the country. And they were lined up under the under the uh, pulpit to my right. And as I was sitting there, they were all in uniform and they all came over and put their, mm. their hand on my head mm -hmm. in, a, in a gesture of blessing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I count, I count that as another uh, religious experience. And, um, you know, that's exactly how I remember it. And um, whether anybody else believes me or not, I don't care because I know it's true. <laughs> and um, so, um, and just going back to the... Um, the Naval Academy or the Navy for a minute. Um, when I was 10 years old, I was at the, um, the U.S. Navy Chapel at the Naval Air Station Norfolk. And in, at that time, which was 1955 or 56, um, that was the busiest airport in the world. It was before, um, before O'Hare got busy. And it was right at the height of the Cold War. Uh, the Soviet Union had detonated an H-bomb about a year earlier, uh, and there was a lot of naval activity, a lot of you know, activity out of that na naval air station. And so, the congregation, uh, 
had a lot of skin in the game. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Okay. And um, so there was this one particular occasion, and this actually happened every week, but I remember particularly occasion where um, the congregation was singing the Navy hymn and and it just very seriously touched my heart um, on that occasion and obviously the um, the congregation was singing the hymn and which is eternal father as you probably know um they were singing it very passionately sure okay. and um uh, anyway so in the navy and the marine corps we sing the navy hymn every uh, every service and both Catholic and Protestant. And if you go into the Naval Academy Chapel on a uh, on just an, a regular business day, on the placard where they put the hymn numbers for the service, um, you will always find eight zero eight which happens to be the number of the Navy hymn in the hymnal. And it uh, just happens that I visited the St. Andrew's Chapel next to the National Cathedral um, a few weeks ago, and I was there on an off day, and, and the hymn placard was empty, as it might well be in your church today. Um, but in in the Naval Academy Chapel, and I think in other Navy chapels around the world, you will find that hymn number uh, on that placard always. And um, the chapel is quite a uh, an impressive building, as you might guess. And over the altar, uh, about I'd say maybe twenty five feet up above the altar, um, in foot high letters that are paint are carved into the concrete or the the stone and then um, painted red or i'm sorry not painted red they're painted gold uh are the words uh eternal father <sighs> sorry eternal father strong to save and um I cannot, I can't sing that hymn anymore. I mean, I, can, I can't even talk about it anymore, that it touches me, because it touches me so deeply and profoundly every time I even think about it. Yeah. And um, it's quite interesting in terms of uh, synchronicities that um, 808 uh, represents two signs of infinity, which represent chaos, of course, and in the center of it is a circle, which represents the mandala, which is the oldest symbol that exists in living beings um, and uh, it is widely attributed to be a symbol of God. And that's why you have rose windows and many chapels around the world, including the Naval Academy Chapel. And, um, and I recently found an image of one, uh, let's see if I have it here quickly. Uh, okay, here's, a, here's an image of a, um, of a mandala uh, from um, Kimberley, Australia. And this is from uh, 50,000 years ago. They've dated this uh, image. I'll just share it with you. Uh, it's, in, it's in a cave, and as you see, it's quite large. Um, and uh, so that symbol has been there for 50,000 years. 
And um, I just want to show you something that may really surprise you in terms of mandalas. Um, in the 1990s, um, some divers in the Sea of Japan were finding mandalas on the, on the seafloor. And so this is one of the images that they took of it. And they were trying to understand what this was. And so over a period of a couple of years, divers looked for these things uh, very deeply. And uh, what they discovered was, uh, let me show you, was this. What they discovered was this fish. It's called... <laughs> It's called the puffer fish or a fugu fish. It's five inches long and it spends five days creating a mandala that is seven feet in diameter on the seafloor. And after the male fugu fish does this, and by the way, this is the uh, fish that in Japanese cuisine, you have to have a very skilled chef because if he doesn't know how to get the yeah. liver out, he'll kill you. Um, but anyway, it's also called a puffer fish. And um, so, as you see in the bottom image here, uh, it completes this mandala, and then the female fish uh, comes and uh, lays her eggs in the middle of this mandala. And um, so I think that that's a really profound idea, because in, in human um, experience, um, obviously in human experience, you know, religions have recognized mandalas for uh, thousands of years, but um, there is an example of a, of a species that um, is creating mandalas and it's doing it automatically and uh, we must have separated off from that species, um, I don't know, two billion years ago. I, don't, I couldn't tell you. Um, and, but I think it's a pretty profound uh, thing. So It's pretty wild. So when, when did you first uh, encounter Jung that you can remember and were impressed by his, his teaching? Was it Man and His Symbols when you were reading it to your wife? Was that the first time or...? Well, the very first time um, was, and only in retrospect do I know that this is the case, right. but when I was working at the University of Maryland teaching finance, um, I, had a, I had a fellow professor who was a PhD in psychology, and uh, she was a beautiful woman, and she kind of matched my anima. Are you familiar with that term? Not really. Okay, well, the anima is the image of the perfect woman in a man's psyche. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Okay, and my, I'll just show you my anima, just so you know what I'm talking about, since I happen to have a photograph of her. Okay, so here's my anima. This is my mother at age 18, and I was born about one year later. And so whenever I see a woman who has hair framing her face, something like that, um, my psyche says, that's the woman for you. Hmm. That gets plenty of men in trouble because <laughs> <laughs> both of my wives have met that characteristic. <laughs> 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 but I run into women on the street every day who <laughs> meet that category. <laughs> so you have to learn how to, uh, how to work with it. <laughs> and so anyway, this woman was sort of this image of my anima, so I was fascinated with her. And she asked me if I knew anything about the Myers-Briggs type indicator, and I didn't so she spent ten year ten days um, at lunch teaching me the Myers Briggs type indicator. Are you familiar with that? Yep. yep. Okay. And then, um, as I said, I was uh, I was a senior officer in the Marine Corps, and I was quite. And she said it was based on the 
work of Jung. And then uh, it so happened that I was selected for uh, four senior schools in the military, um, the Command and Staff College of the Marine Corps, the Naval War College, the National War College, and the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. And at every one of those senior schools, and oh, by the way, I also experienced it at the Center for Creative Leadership, uh, which is in Greensboro, North Carolina, and it's a place where every brigadier general in the U.S. Army, before he's frocked, in other words, before he gets his star, he has to attend the Center for Creative Leadership. And in all those places, I was introduced to the Myers-Briggs type indicator. That's how important the U.S. military thinks it is. Hmm. And Still, I... They still use it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, because um, it represents the four natural functions of um, an individual. And um, in, um, if you're preparing an, um, for a mission, uh, you first want people uh, th this forms a Z, but anyway, uh, you first want people who are sensing, who can get all the facts, all the details. And then you want uh, someone who's intuitive, who can figure out what the facts mean. Um, and then you want someone who's a thinker uh, to discern, figure out, slice and dice, to figure out what to do about that meaning and those facts and exactly how you're going to go about your order of battle. And then you need someone who's a feeler, who has the feeling function, who can um, sort of warn you about the consequences of whatever you're proposing to do. So every military mission um, that is, let's say, um, field grade and above, so not company grade, but anything that involves a battalion or higher in the U.S. military has has officers, more than one, who've been through the Myers-Briggs training more than once and who know that you have to have people of all those personality types in order to properly prepare your mission. And, um, of course, most... Uh, military officers are sensing, thinking, and judging. Um, and so 95% of all generals and admirals fill those, those criteria. It so happened that um, I am intuitive thinking and perceiving. <laughs> and so I, I wasn't a, a classic Marine, but on the other hand, uh, the top generals, the th three-star and four-star generals, tend to be um, intuitive, uh, not sensing, um, because they're the ones that are able to handle politics. And, um, you know, Marines will always come to an officer and say, I'll do anything you tell me to do, sir, but just don't make me deal with the politics. <laughs> 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 right. Just give me a just give me a mission, and I'll go out and kill that guy. But I'm not gonna, you know, I don't want to know anything about the politics. Those are the generals are for politics. That's right. <laughs> and, and so, you know, the classic example would be Colin Powell, but um, you know, General Kelly would be an example, and General uh, uh, the recent Secretary of Defense would be an example of officers who are more intuitive and more thoughtful uh, about how they uh, proceed with what they're doing. Um, and um, So that's how you got to know, you had an introduction to Jung, but obviously for you, 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 you found something, you saw something there that engaged you quite a bit more deeply. Right. So then I, you know, read Women Who Run With the Wolves, and I had that eight-month-long experience as a result of that. And then um, carrying on, then I had the experience with my daughter. Right. And then subsequently, I've had, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, I have to tell you that 
after my experience with my daughter, I was really angry with religion for quite some time um, because I, I realized that it was a manipulative technique and I was angry that anyone would teach a child to say such a thing to their parent. And, um, and so I spent a good 10 years getting into uh, Jung without going into Jung. Okay. In other words, I read a lot of things around Jung, but, but I had, a, I had made an assumption, which is incorrect, that um, I, his main writing was about clinical psychology, in which I had no interest. Mm -hmm. But um, starting about 2005, I realized that the, the main thrust of his writing, uh, right from 1913 on, was about religion, and it wasn't about um, it wasn't about psychology per se. I mean, the Jungians uh, created a psychology profession around his work, but that was not his doing. And he's famously, he famously at one point said, I'm glad I'm young, so I don't have to be a Jungian. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, you know, I, there, that's a lot. I, I think Luther would be horrified that there's a group of people that call themselves Lutherans. I think Calvin would be horrified that people call themselves Calvinists. So this yeah. is a long, this is, there's a long line of folks. Now, now you just, you just on one point said, talked about, you know, re, your, your attitudes towards religion because of the experience with your daughter and then you just said that Jung was about religion. Now, what, how, what do you mean when you use the word religion in both of those senses? Well, I, I think I was thinking in terms of Christianity at the, at the time. I w wasn't really thinking of it very broadly. Although um, my, my wife, and let me do I'll just full disclosure here. My wife is a, is a fully trained um, Tibetan Buddhist Lama. Uh, however, she's not a, ordained. She's not t Tibetan. She's Caucasian American. But but she since 1994, um, she wrote to me once and said that she was um, she read a book called the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, and it was the one book if she was caught on a desert island, it's the one book she would want, and since then she's been totally into Buddhism and to the point of doing everything up to ordination. And uh, she's one of the leading teachers in the Washington area. And uh, also she's, uh, she's trained to be a companion for the dying and she works at a hospice. And so, um, she volunteers at the same hospice to sit with people who are dying. And, um, and so there's a joke in Japan that people are Shinto when they get married, but they're Buddhist when they're dying. <laughs> um, and um, so anyway. Um, so you've got religions around you. So right. And, and plus I was, I, plus I was, brought up in Japan, kind of, because right. I, I went to high school in Japan, and I lived one mile from the great Buddha of Kamakura, and, um, and I, so I had some uh, fundamental experiences around that. Let me just point this out to you so that you get the flavor of it here. Okay, so I, I lived one mile from this statue, which was built in 1295, and um, I live one mile from this statue for three years, and I've gone back to it periodically ever since. Um, and then there was there's another one, um, which I'll share with you. Um, this is an image called uh, Ofuna Kanan, and this is um, the goddess of mercy in Chinese. Um, custom it's called Kuan Yin and um, the statue was built uh, completed about two months before I arrived in Japan and it's um, 
Kuan Yin is the goddess who went into the underworld and redeemed the souls of the um, World War II dead for the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was uh, going to high school in Japan, every day I rode on a train, the Yokosuka line of the, of the National Railway, uh, that went right by this. This is actually right next to the Ofuna train station in, in Japan. And so I would see this statue every day. And, you know, sometimes I would uh, be upset about something that was going on in school, whatever it might have been. And, um, and so I found this statue quite soothing to me. Um, you know, I wouldn't say I knew anything about it other than that uh, during my growing up period, but I, I just found looking at that statue quite soothing. But anyway, I but, did. But, but again, I, this, this idea that Jung speaks about religion, I mean, I'm yes. just trying to figure out right. what you mean by that. Well, he, uh, Edward Edinger, who was a leading Jungian analyst of the late 20th century, uh, said that Dr. Jung found the source of all religions, and uh, he pointed to that. And uh, so then he worked mostly with Christianity, but he had written a lot of material on, on other religions, including he wrote um, introductions to the Tibetan Book of the Dead and uh, to um, Suzuki's book on Zen and uh, you know a number of other uh, religions. Um, and so, so anyway, he was up to his armpits in religion. Okay, and so he obviously created a big furor when in 1956 he was interviewed by the BBC and he was asked, um, do you believe in God? And he said, well, uh, very complicated, but I have no need to believe, I know. And when he said that, um, the first time I saw that video and he said that, um, I had an epiphany because I too know. And, and so then I had to spend 10 years figuring out what it was I know. And so now I think I do know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think so I'm conscious you, of what I know, but by that, can, can they, you explain that a little bit for us? Well, because it's obviously a bit, I mean, you can find it on YouTube and it's, I think when I listen to a lot of different people hear, you know, okay, so they hear it and then, I'll ask them, okay, what do, you, what do you think that means? What's the difference between believing and knowing? Well, the difference is that uh, believing is, and this goes to the issue of the conscious and the unconscious, the profane and the sacred. Uh, and it, but belief is what a lawyer achieves when he's making his oral argument to a jury. And so a lawyer can convince a jury of something, whatever it is, and that's all very logical. Um, and so as an attorney, I'm well-trained in the logic of convincing people of something. Um, but knowing is, is something else. No, knowing is sacred. Knowing is uh, on the opposite side of the coin, not in the logos side of the coin, but the eros side of the coin. And so it's not a question of somebody convincing me. Okay, there was no pastor that convinced me. I mean, I asked my Calvinist, uh, my my Reformed pastor, forty years ago, what how he would define God, or you know what he would could tell me about God, and uh, he gave me a totally lame answer, which just basically turned me off at that time. Um, and it didn't turn me away from religion per se, but uh, it was clear to me that he didn't get it, <laughs> that he didn't know, okay, that he, that, and, 
you know, so there's, there's a question of whether you, you know, as a pastor, I'm sure you're probably aware that some pastors, you know, learn their lessons in, in, um, in divinity school and um, are cookie cutter pastors. They know what to say on a given day. So on Easter Sunday, you give this lesson and say these things and, and you've accomplished your task. And at Christmas, you do this, and at Pentecost, you do this, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure, as in law school, you know, you learn your lessons, and, and you can go out, and you can get some people to believe, okay? And no question about it. Um, and so Dr. Young's point was that he was not doing his work for people who had the, what he called the charisma of belief, um, because if people believe, then they believe. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But his, his research and work for 45 years was basically to, um, to help those who had lost connection. And, uh, you know, it's my analysis that uh, the problem with the Christian church is that Largely, the connection has been lost between the sacred and and the what's taught. And um, so, what is the sacred? Well, the sacred is um, the opposite of the profane. Okay, and so there are a few different ways we can refer to it. Um, and this is this is where Jordan Peterson comes in because. Um, you know, Jordan Peterson wants order. And so he wrote a book that's all logos and it's intended to be a bulwark against the chaos, but um, the chaos is where the sacred is. And so it's, um, we can say it's conscious or unconscious, it's logos or eros. And so you shouldn't get me wrong, okay? We need logos, 100%, okay? Everything that you see in this image, both your side and my side, is the result of logos because <clears throat> you can't engineer something and build something or make something without having gone through a very logical, rational process. That's what logos is. And that's largely the way religion is taught these days. Um, but, um, but God doesn't live there. And also, we also need the arrows because, again, everything that you see in the image in front of you uh, had its origin in imagination and in... Um, well, in imagination and, and fantasy. And so even you and I were once twinkles in our father's eyes. And so without someone imagining every single item that you see in this picture, um, there were, none of these items would be here. <laughs> okay. So, so we need both sides of the equation. And unfortunately, I mean, what I saw in the discussion between Bishop Barron and Jordan Peterson uh, was that they were both compl completely besotted on the Logos side. And uh, God doesn't live there. Okay. God lives in the chaos. And, um, when, you know, I'm a businessman, I'm not a theologian, and I'm, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a businessman. So I listened to Bishop Barron, and he says, well, I'm the chairman of a group of Roman Catholic bishops, or a committee of Roman Catholic bishops, whose job it is to bring people in, back into the Catholic Church, and we're losing six for every one we bring in. And I look at that from a businessman's point of view, and I say, man, if you were working for me, you'd be fired. You know, I'll be my sales manager. You can't, you can't sell it, okay? <laughs> and, 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 so, and so the problem for Jordan Peterson <clears throat> seems to be um, 
that he, you know, you any number of times have referred to Jordan as a, as a Jungian, but he's not a Jungian because he hasn't understood Jung. And, um, and he explicitly says in one of his presentations about Jung that, that uh, Ion, which is one of Jung's most profound books, uh, terrifies him. And the reason is because it's not talking about the rational world, it's talking about the irrational. And that's the fundamental aspect of Jung going all the way back. And, um, you know, you were talking about uh, John Verbeke, and John Verbeke says, um, you can't talk about Jung if you don't understand Kant. Well, the, un the thing that you have to understand about Kant and Jung is that from their point of view, you don't get anything from a psychological perspective without experience, okay? And so uh, if you have an experience, a religious experience, an experience of God, as I have been described earlier, um, then, then you're going to get it. But if you don't, you won't. And so what's an example of that? Well, okay, um, how many books will it take you to convince a two-year-old that the stove is hot? And, um, you know, will they get it? And they won't. Okay, there's no way that you can convince a two-year-old what hot means until they touch the stove. Then they've had the experience, and then they know what hot means. And it's exactly like that. I mean, in, at the end of the movie Contact, um, Jodie Foster's act asked uh, uh, by the congressman, um, do you love your mother? Or no, I, she's asked by uh, uh, the male lead in that movie. She's asked, do you love your mother? And she says, of course I do. And he says, prove it. Okay, and, and so that's the point. With logos, you can't prove things like that, okay, because those are all on the other side of the coin. And all religion is there, because all religion uh, has in its origins numinous experience, okay? And so all... Abrahamic religions, to include Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, point back to Abraham and to the um, the saving in Christianity and Judaism. You would say Isaac. Well, uh, this past week I had a had a Muslim young woman staying with me, and um, she came out of her out of the bedroom. Uh, Sunday morning, and she said, it's Eid, and and happy, like a kid would say it at Christmas time. It's Christmas, right? And so I, she goes in the bathroom, and I said, geez, I better figure out what Eid al-Abha is about, and it turns, <laughs> right? And it turns out that Eid al-Abha is about um, saving Abraham's son, except the son that's saved in Islam is Ishmael. It's not Isaac. And if you think about it, Ishmael was the first son of Abraham. And so they might be right, <laughs> except, um, so I'm not going to get in the middle of that one. <laughs> but, but my Jewish friend, who is a former president of the World Union of Progressive Jews, um, and a classmate of mine has written a book called Finding Ourselves in Biblical Narratives, um, or it's called uh, What's in It for Me, Finding Ourselves in Biblical Narratives, what I, which I uh, put online, uh, and I can give you the link to that. But anyway, um, his point about that story is that that marked the end of human sacrifice in the Western world. In, in those religions, okay, the apparent, you know, um, human beings got the, 
wild idea that they should sacrifice their children to propitiate God. And it went on in horrific form for uh, millennia until that event, until Abraham's numinous event of having a vision that he could um, sacrifice his, uh, sacrifice the goat that was on the hill instead of his son. And that was the end of human sacrifice. And, um, and so that was obviously a very traumatic effect, event for Abraham. It engendered that vision, and that vision in turn ended human sacrifice in the Western world. Um, now, can we talk a little bit about Logos and Eros a little bit? I want to kind of come back to that because that's a really important distinction and differentiation for you. Now, Eros, obviously, for um, Eros is one of the Greek words for love. And it's, there's, there's actually quite a bit of interesting discussion around that word. And so I wanted to get a sense, and you know, by, by setting it in contrast to Logos the way you did, I think I have an idea of where you're, where you're going. And I understand what you say. You know, when we look you know, through these little cameras at each other's rooms, everything in our room is a product of Logos, intentionality, reason, you know, logical application, all of that. Everything is also a, a consequence of Eros. And what I think you mean by Eros is desire. Um, you know, they're wanted. That, that, that's what you're projecting on it. Well, okay, so I'd like to know. Right, because, uh, yes, because we take the word erotic from Eros and so Yeah, on. I didn't mean sexual desire, but, but right. yeah, but, but I'm curious but, about how, what you, you mean know, by that. That's probably what the, you know, it's something like what the Greeks were talking about. I have no idea. But the same dichotomy, and, and mind you, it's not right to keep putting in things in one bucket or the other and saying there's a duality between these two buckets and I'm just going to pile things up on one side or the other sure. and do that. So, so the dualities, which are basically equivalent, but maybe in other dimensions. Okay. So one is in a religious dimension and one's in a psychological debate. Absolutely. Dimension. So one is the profane and the sacred and then order and chaos and logos and eros and conscious and unconscious all those dualities are basically the same duality and so it's you know it's dangerous in the in puritanical usa to mention anything that has anything to do with eros because the, the Puritan strain of the American psyche uh, goes wild and thinks you're talking about prostitution or something like that. But the reality is that in the sacred is where God lives, okay? In the chaos is where God lives. And religions are ways of dealing with the chaos of the universe, that's what they are, as a way of explaining the chaos and interacting with it and dipping into it. Um, and and then basically that's what Dr. Jung taught for 45 years. I mean, obviously God is ineffable, uh, omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Uh, and which so, are seminary attributes taught in divinity school. Right. But as soon as, as soon as everything that we say is logos, okay, everything that's been in this discussion up till now, every word that ever comes out of your mouth is logos. But um, logos can only point at the sacred, okay, and point at what the right answers are. It cannot be it. And so that's why you cannot t teach a child what a hot stove is without having them experience it. Well, you can't, you can't um, teach anything about God without having an experience of it, or you shouldn't. I mean, Dr. Jung said only the, only the wounded doctor can heal, while well, only the experienced 
theologian can theo theologize, I would think. Um, now, it's interesting, and this is sort of where, I don't know if you watched the Verveke, um, the whole Verveke video where he talked about that, because in, in some ways that boundary when only the wounded doctor can heal, only the, let's say, only the, the theologian who has experienced the ineffable can theologize. I mean, there's, there's some of that Kantian, there's some of that, that Kantian border in there because the, I mean, what Kant was dealing with is obviously the, you know, the, the thing in itself versus the, this thing that, that is above the, what's, what's interesting about that border is that at some point, when you, when you make the distinction between only the wounded doctor can heal, somewhere in that doctor then, because the doctor is wounded, the doctor now has a new capacity to communicate, and to transmit. And then the question would be to transmit through what? To transmit through logos? And so that's a... That's an interesting question to me. Oh, I mean, the question is, how do you um, produce a numinous experience? And um, so that people understand what you're talking about, okay? And um, Edward Edinger wrote this book. Let me show it to you. The Bible and the Psyche, Individuation, Symbolism in the Old Testament by Edward Ed Edinger. Now, what this book does is it takes the process that Dr. Jung spoke of throughout his career, which is individuation, and let me describe individuation for you in this way. An oak tree, when, when an acorn is planted in the ground, uh, as soon as it sprouts in any way, it already contains everything it needs to become that oak tree, that specific oak tree. And o every oak tree meets all these classifications, but every oak tree is different, okay? Human beings are like that, okay? We're all human beings, but every one of us is different. And the process of individuation is the process of understanding what we are intended to be. And so one of the things that Dr. Jung talked about was the fact that when you think of things as one after another, okay, that's pretty easy for everybody. We all understand time as a continuum. But in Dr. Jung's point is that in, in the chaos, everything is, time is kind of irrelevant. And so what this, what the Old Testament does is it provides um, stories for the individuation process. And these, and this is what you're doing when you're narrating a Old Testament story is you're conveying an experience that we all have. Okay. Every human being has these stories, but the point is, they're all being experienced every day, all day long, in every human being in the world. And the Old Testament and the New Testament, but since this book is about the Old Testament, this one's about the New Testament, um, the point is that, that if you sell the Old Testament as this is about the ancients, and you start to tell me a story about what happened to them 2,500 years ago, I go to sleep, okay? I just can't stay awake in a sermon that's like that. Um, but if you tell me that same story, but tell me how it relates to me today, then it connects, okay? And the point is, and so the point is that these are not old stories, okay? These are stories that are numinous, that are proven over thousands of years and have been refined over thousands of years and have been taught over thousands of years, and they're still true, and that's why the Bible is still a living document. But if you sell the document as 
it's just the word and this is what we believe. Um, you know, no, that's not what is happening anymore. The, the 20th century is proof of that. And Frederick Friedrich Nietzsche was right when he said God is dead because God taught in that way was killed by the scientific method because the, the stories of the Bible uh, as presented, if they're presented as, as literal truth, um, that's why you have so many atheists and agnostics today because they say, well, why should I believe that? Because, you know, we have this scientific thing that says this isn't right. And, and, uh, and so it's not about that. It's about the fact that these narratives are right, they're true, and they're true right now for every single human being on the planet. And, um, and the reason they're taught is because of that. And um, this isn't science, this is religion. This, you know, this is, this is, um, a way of presenting things that are chaotic, uh, that are sacred, that are chaotic in such a way that we can interact with them. Um, you know, I, um, and so when I listened to Bishop Barron a couple weeks back, I said, oh my God, I have to go back and look at John 1, 1 because I wanted to understand, well, you know, if, if in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and there was, and so on, uh, then hasn't anything happened since the beginning? <laughs> okay, I, I asked that question. But then I opened my book, and lo and behold, um, John 1 through 14, John 1, 1 through 14 isn't about that at all. It's about the light and the life. And so this is just a black doorstop unless you put life into it. I'm sure you put life into it every week in your sermon. But, um, but you have to connect. There has to be a connection between the person in the pew and um, and God. And now, now we've, we've gone on for a little while and I've got a limited sure. amount of time. So I do want to hit a little bit more about Jordan and, and then I'm sure in subsequent conversations, we'll pick it up. So, you know, Jordan Peterson is, I've talked to a number of people who know way more about Carl Jung than I do. And for many people, Jordan Peter, they were very excited to see the, the rise of Jordan, the rise of interest in Jordan Peterson and his work, partly because he Peterson talks about Jung regularly. Jung is is one of the most quoted people by Jordan Peterson, and those of us who have listened to a good number of his material could probably rattle off some of the favorite Jung quotes and illustrations that he likes to bring forward. And right. I mean, the, the the takeaway quote: If I were taking sound bites out of video, one would be. Jordan Peterson is not a Jungian because it's like, wow. <laughs> and anybody who goes to your channel can see, I mean, you, people say to me, I put a lot of, out a lot of video. And I would say, if you think I put out a lot of video, you should look at this guy. <laughs> this guy puts out a lot of video. <laughs> I've, been, I've been doing my best. Well, so um, I, and you know, okay. I probably on a subsequent talk, I'd probably want to get into a little bit more because we talked a little bit about your vision and your mission, why you put out so much stuff. But I, I'd like at least maybe a teaser for a next conversation. So Jordan Peterson kind of exploded on the scene. And you and I, um, I mean, in many ways, I didn't have anything of a video channel, but took off. And for both of us, probably we gained a fair number of listeners because of Jordan Peterson and because of renewed interest in Jung. And so you know, you know, we've got, I should probably wrap this up in about 15 minutes or so, but, but what's your, you know, what's your hot take on this with Peterson? So when you well, first saw Peterson on, were you excited? And then, because you've had some, you know, well, I've had some, let's put it this way. I've learned a hell of a lot from Jordan Peterson. No okay. doubt. Okay. I never yep. took a psychology course. 
okay, I, I've never taken a psychology course. My only exposure to psychology has been Jung. Uh, and so when I read, read Maps of Meaning, I, I learned a lot and so on. But then when I read 12 Rules of Life, I had to say no, you know, uh, because you can't live by rules. And um, because, you know, a professor can give you all the rules and everything in a textbook up to the day you graduate. But oh, by the way, then you have to go out and live your life. And there, and, and that's chaos. And, and so, um, so you can't think that you can live your life based on rules because, you know, they can point you in the right direction. Theologians can point you in the right direction on Sunday morning. Uh, but in the end, um, we have to live our lives. And, and so then, uh, then you have to understand something about living. And so the fundamental thing that Jordan has missed, is, or may, I don't know how consciously he's talking about this, but he, I mean, he explicitly said on one of those videos about Jung, he says, well, the way to talk about Jung is to talk about this other thing. Uh, no, <laughs> he didn't talk about Jung. And what he said was in that same lecture uh, that Ion terrifies him. Why does it terrify him? Because he wants a bulwark against chaos, which means he wants a bulwark against the, the sacred. And uh, Dr. Jung was not about logos, not one bit, not for a minute. Okay, and so I happen to have um, my copy of the reader's edition of the Red Book here. And so this was Jung writing in um, 1914 or so. And I just want to read the first two paragraphs. So this was 46 years before the end of his career. And his whole career was about this first two paragraphs. So it'll help you get an appreciation because it's what Jordan has gotten. Okay, so he says, if I speak to you in the spirit of this time, I must say no one and nothing can justify what I must proclaim to you. Justification is super, superfluous to me since I have no choice, but I must. I have learned that in addition to the spirit of this time, there's still another spirit at work. I think you've referred to this other spirit as the spirit of finesse in the last couple of days, but there, there's another spirit at work, namely that which rules the depths of everything contemporary. The spirit of this time would like to hear of use and value. I also thought this way, and my humanity still thinks this way. But that other spirit forces me nevertheless to speak beyond justification, use, and meaning. Filled with human pride and blinded by the presumptuous spirit of the time, I long sought to hold that other spirit away from me. But I did not consider the spirit of the depths from time immemorial and for all the future possesses a greater power than the spirit of this time who changes with the generations. The spirit of the depths has subjugated all pride and arrogance to the power of judgment. He took away my belief in science. He, he robbed me of the joy of explaining and ordering things, and he let devotion to the ideals of this time die out in me. He forced me down to the last and simplest things. The spirit of the depths took my understanding and all my knowledge and placed them at the service of the inexplic inexplicable and the paradoxical. He robbed me of speech and writing for everything that was not in his service, namely the melting together of sense and nonsense, which produces the supreme meaning. And so that That's is... That's 1914, which is obviously a very interesting year. Right. And, and uh, he was going through a traumatic experience of his own at this time, at the time that he wrote the Red Book. And... Um, he was, he had been steeped in Nietzsche, but steeped also in Calvinist religion because his father was a, was a reformed pastor and so were six or seven of his uncles. So he yeah, was, yeah, yeah. was up to his armpits in. 
They and, come that way often. And so Nietzsche proclaimed that God is dead, and thus it spoke spake Zarathustra. Jung comes along in the de- next generation. He finds the living God, where he lives, and how he goes about doing the business of the Godhead. And that's the fundamental story of Jung. And, um, and Jordan Peterson said he's terrified of, of what he found, but what he found is the sacred, the chaos, the, uh, the unconscious. And, you know, what you, what you teach every Sunday, actually. <laughs> Simple as that. So, so it's interesting. So, so you read Maps of Meaning, but then 12 Rules for Life for you was really a departure from Jung because he has, you know, distilled these rules and he has, I mean, he's, I mean, it's an antidote to chaos. That's the subtitle of the book. Right. And and he is trying to give these rules to young people, young men in many ways. Um, let me let me clarify something. I think okay. Jordan Peterson represents a father figure for at least half of the male population of the world right now who have been brought up in homes with no father figure. And so I agree with Jordan, 98.5% of the time, probably, probably 99.5% of the time. Where I get off is where he starts to name drop on Jung, and it's fine that he comes up with a few Jungian concepts, which are uh, true as enough as far as they go, but the fact that he's not willing to go over into Ion and to understand what Jung's work was about um, is is a mistake and um, it's very simply it's a mistake and uh, and it, it you can see it in his uh, video about whether he believes in God he's so pained he's in such angst about that because from a logos point of view he cannot he cannot say he believes in God. And, um, you know, on, from a Jungian point of view, I can say, I don't have to believe, I know. You know, there's nothing that you can say on, on uh, Sunday morning that will convince me anything more than my personal religious experiences. Let me just give you an example. I mean, these things come up as synchronicities, but about two weeks ago, um, I had done an interview with uh, Murray Stein, who wrote a book called uh, Jung's Map of the Soul, an Introduction. And during that interview, Murray Stein uh, said that he had talked to a grandson of Jung, and he said that, that Jung always carried a Bible in his pocket, and whenever he had a free moment, he could be seen reading his pocket Bible. Now, I never thought about having, that was Sunday, uh, 10 days ago, all right? And so on Monday, I was doing my regular evening, uh, Monday evening live stream. And five minutes before that, I, and I've never thought about having a pocket Bible, it never occurred to me. I mean, I heard Mary say that on Sunday, uh, Monday evening at, at 7.50, my Muslim house guest walks into the room, hands me this, and <laughs> and says, "Well, actually, she handed me two. And <laughs> she handed me two. She says, "I want you to have these." She had been to a county fair, uh, <laughs> and the Gideons were there, and the Gideons were there, and they gave her a Bible, and she said, "I want you to have this." Okay, and so. For me, that's a religious experience. That's a synchronicity that definitely points to the sacred, okay? Because Mary Stein mentions Jung and the Bible and a pocket Bible, and the next day I have one in my hand from a Muslim, okay? (laughs) (laughs) That's fun. That's why I have no need to believe. Okay. And 
It's also why I wore my purple shirt today. But. <laughs> well, we've got just a few more minutes, and I've, I, you've been really gracious in that. I've been sort of driving with the, my questions, and you've been answering my questions, and I appreciate that. Any, any last things in the next seven, eight minutes you, you'd like to ask me or we'd like to wrap up with? I'm, you know, I, no, I, I, you and I are going to talk more, obviously, as months, as months go, but um, yeah. I, uh, I really appreciate you. And I mean, you and I have exchanged emails back and forth and messages and such, and you've always been extremely gracious. And I've had questions sometimes about Jung and you've sent me many materials and I've, I've really appreciated your willingness to, to share with me a lot of what you've gained over the, over the years. Well, so Paul, I, um, extremely pleased to find you. Okay. And to see how you had been drawn to Jordan Peterson's, um, Old Testament uh, lectures, his 13 lectures. Um, and it shows that you understand that there's something missing. There's something needed in the way religion is presented in the world. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind that that's true in both the Protestant and the Catholic denominations. And um, there and I see, I do see an evolution in the way you interact with these things, okay? Um, and I see it, you know, even though you, you rarely mention me, occasionally you do, but, and I'm not asking you to, but, I, but even though you rarely mention me, I do see an evolution in your perspective. And, um, And so I hope that continues, and I know that that's necessary if religions are going to mean what they should mean going forward. And of course, the burning question for Christianity is, is Christianity passe, or is Judaism passe? And what I would say is, and as proven by these books, okay, this is the other one, Christian Archetype, Union Commentary on the Life of Christ. Um, what they prove is that they're incredibly now, okay? These narratives are not stories about people 2,500 years ago or 3,500 years ago in the case of Abraham, but these are stories about us now we have to understand them and it needs to be sold in that way. It, it's not about, uh, you know, I'm going to now tell you a story that's 2000 years old. Okay. That's not it. Okay. It's a story about now and we all have these experiences and these experiences have been refined over thousands of years. The reason the Bible is the most widespread book in the world is because it contains the truth of the human condition. And it contains it just as much now as it did in 325 AD or in whenever, when the book of Job was written or whatever. And and it, they need to be understood in that way, okay? And from a li religious point of view, I hope you'll think about it in that way. Well, I certainly do. I, 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 I would phrase it more that the, the, the book isn't merely stories about people in the past. And I think that's, I mean, as a preacher, preachers are always uh, – uh, Stott, John Stott made the point in his book on preaching, preachers are always working between two worlds. And so someone, you know, I, I, I in fact have the experience of people sleeping through my sermon sometimes. Um, I have no doubt. But <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and in fact, if, if, you know, I will sometimes put earbuds in and fall asleep in other people's sermons. So that's, I don't, I don't get offended when people sleep in mine sometimes, but you know, when someone wanders into my church and sits down in a seat, very much what I want to do is help them see that the, the things in this book are in fact talking to them about their life. 
And it's in that middle space where we try to connect it. Well, that's the, that's the challenge. And that's in many ways, you know, when the magic happens. I, that I, I've told the story quite often that often when someone will, after a worship service, they'll come and they'll shake my hand and they'll say, Pastor, your, your sermon really spoke to me. And if I get a chance, I'll say, okay, well, what, 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 what did you hear that spoke to you? And often they'll say something I didn't say. And so it's like, okay, well, um, you know, something I said prompted something and it was helpful for them. And so right. I, I, preachers are, are just one small part of a much bigger picture. And I'm, I'm happy to be a small thing. Well, I think, I think you're potentially a big thing because I think that you're potentially the, one of the few people that can understand the value of what you heard from Jordan Peterson. Okay. I don't want to, I don't want to detract from the brilliance of his uh, old Testament lectures. They're brilliant. There's no doubt about that. And he's a brilliant man. There's no doubt about that. And, um, and, but the issue really is this issue of two sides of a coin logos versus eros. Mm -hmm. And um, and sacred versus profane, the sacred being all those things that we can't put our hand, fingers on, and um, and but you can't live without. But you can't live without, right? Because you, because as Jung demonstrated, we we have to have a uh, religious function going in our body, and. Um, and he said clearly that that uh, you you uh, he never he never achieved a cure of anyone who was having a mental health issue if they didn't find a religious uh, attitude toward life in in the latter after age thirty five, and um, and one can know uh, Dr. Edinger. Uh, gave a lecture called Encounters with a Greater Personality, which is uh, one name for the God image or the self in variously used in Jungian psychology. But uh, in his talk on Encounters with a Greater Personality, he, he said that the, one can know when something falls on him that he would, or, or Jung said, the experience that one has to have so that they know instead of believe it is uh, similar to the, um, uh, the enunciation. Hmm. That's, that's how he would describe it. Hmm. And I can definitely tell you that my experiences are in that order of magnitude. And, um, and so you know, and from my point of view, I know I don't have to believe it. And, um, that's, that's the way it is. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much, Skip, for your time. I know you're, you're very busy with your channel and with the other things that you do. And, and I really appreciate you being, you've been very generous with your time with me, not just now, but in other conversations, you know, with emails and messages, and you've shared so much material with me. And I, I really appreciate your spirit of generosity and, and how helpful you've been. And I, I hope to continue to be a help. Okay. Well, thank <laughs> you, Skip. It was good talking to you and we'll schedule another talk. Shall we go ahead and publish this interview? Sure. That's fine. You can go ahead and publish it today. It'll probably come out a little bit later this week for me. Okay. Well, terrific. Okay. Nice. All to right, Skip. Take care now. Yep. Bye-bye.